oh, this doesn't have. So I really need to maneuver her into Zoom meetings and then she just runs away. Perfect. So what a fabulous introduction to the amazing Deep mm -hmm. Tran and her beautiful cat, Viola. Uh, Viola, yes, like talk Viola. night. Hello, and this is my, my okay. mitten. Oh, oh, is she, he, she, or he, she, she is, she is a cashmere cat <laughs> um, and loves nothing more than a Zoom meeting. So she will be back to show off in front of the camera. Um, hi. Hi. You're here. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks for asking. It's so weird. I've only ever interviewed you. And so there's going to be a fun little switcheroo that we're doing today. It is a little bit of a switcheroo. I am in no way your equal at interviews or investigative and thoughtful journalism. So this is going to be just me going, how do you do with the things you do? <laughs> I'm not doing um, either of those things right now. So. <laughs> Well, that is why it is a, both a weird time, um, but also a really interesting time to talk about mm -hmm. the kind of strange collaboration between all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not making a lot of theater right now. There's less theater for you to do what you do so well and writing and thinking about it and offering criticism and perspective. But there is, it's still out there and it's still mm -hmm. of us. And so I wanted to, um, here we go. Um, so I wanted to to talk with you about kind of since we're all in versions of pause, maybe taking some time to think about how we are related to each other, what mm -hmm. what collaboration looks like between journalists and critics and playwrights and theater makers and aren't you a theater maker as well as I am and all of these kind of great questions. But um, knowing that our audience is going to be uh, a lot of theater makers. Um, mm -hmm. students of theater and practitioners. Um, yeah, let's aim our kind of conversation towards what might be helpful to those folks. Um, mm -hmm. Would you start, well, for, let me just tell everybody, this is Deep Tran, she's amazing. She's a writer um, uh, of theater, uh, all sorts of things, think pieces, criticism, theater journalism, interviews of theater artists, has worked at broadway.com and American Theater Magazine and all the things. Your piece for, was it, it was Slate, the Miss Saigon piece. That was so mm. amazing. Um, that was actually for American Theater, but American a, theater. A, few, a few people picked it up. So that was fun. Yeah, that was such an amazing, I mean, mm -hmm. such a necessary and vital um, conversation. And your wonderful podcast with Jose, Token Theater Friends, is just delightful and important as well. So, I mean, um, I would just love to know how you got to doing this. How did you become <laughs> a writer? focusing on theater and and what yeah like school and interest and who were you yeah. as a 10 year old and what what is that <laughs> oh my god it's so it's so weird being i because I, I just realized that 2021 is going to be my 10 year anniversary in new york oh wow yeah right and it made me and and as i've been eight as i've progressed in this career i've gotten more of that the similar question of like how do, how do you do this? How did you get started? That kind of thing. And I'm just like, wait, I'm the person? That, that, wait, I used to be the one asking these questions. How, how did I become the person? You're the person. And I'm really uncomfortable with that because I, I feel like journalism. Oh, she has, oh, hairball. One second. Great. Totally valid. Hey, We're going to look at that. my cat oh. for a moment. Hello, Mitten. What do you think about the state of American theater? She has very few opinions <laughs> about theater. She has opinions about lots of other things. <laughs> I'm sure that's never happened before. Oh, I just needed to like get her off the bed if that is the correct <laughs> response. That. And it has to be done now. You cannot delay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I've, what are we talking about? Okay. We're talking about how you became you, you and how that is like a strange reality for you to be in that position of kind of wisdom and uh yeah me mentorship the funny thing the funny thing is i always like the, the reason the whole reason i got started in journalism is because i wanted to be a writer i wanted to write novels but i know you don't actually get paid to do that to do that to do creative writing <laughs> and so i thought oh how can i make money as a writer that's i just want to be a writer and I realized journalism could be a pathway to do that. 
that was, you know, that was in 2007 before the big crash. And, and I feel like the recession kind of started the death knell of journal of journalism as a thing that people pay for. And I feel like this time also is kind of am also amplifying that. Mm -hmm. But that's, a, that's another topic, I got off topic there. But I don't think it's off topic. I think this is part of when we talk about coming out of this and coming back, mm -hmm. it doesn't just mean let's get shows on stages. It means let's have the community of thinkers and makers, including journalists and critics, being a part of that. That is mm -hmm. an essential part of the, the ecosystem of this art form. And I think it's a great thing. I actually haven't heard that said, <laughs> really. is like, that's part of what we mean by saving the arts and bringing the arts back is all of the players and all of the, the, the corners of this, this industry that kind of complete the geometry of it. That's yeah. a lot of metaphors all at once. Know, so you're better at this than me. <laughs> oh no, I, I, I feel, well, as someone who's the most produced playwright in the country, I feel like you're, <laughs> I, and I'm sure, I'm sure if it's on a stage, you're, you're a lot better if you have other people. <laughs> I can handle a stage. I can handle a yeah, stage. Exactly. <laughs> um, I know better metaphors than I am. But anyway. Yeah. But um, how theater? Yeah. How did you get to theater? Because it's one thing to be like a journalist, but why theater right? journalism? How did you find right? that? Okay. So the theater, the theme of my career is uh, it's basically it's all accidental and things just kind of <laughs> open themselves up to me and I just kind of follow. So how that got started was um, I was an English major in undergrad and I, and I love visual arts. I, I was an art history major too. Hmm. And I thought, oh, I love the arts. Maybe I'll just write about the arts and then it'll be a great way to me be, for me to be around really creative people. So that will kind of feed my own creativity and writing about the arts is a lot less depressing than writing about <laughs> politics or any of the other terrible things that are happening in the world like when I told my mom I was going to be a journalist she was like don't be one of those journalists who goes overseas and covers wars oh god <laughs> it's it's good advice mom <laughs> yeah exactly like like right but you know don't do anything dangerous that's that uh, sounds like a mom a mom piece of advice exactly <laughs> and so I started so I started writing about visual arts and then that kind of expanded itself to writing about performance because you know once you cover you don't really in in most journalistic outlets you don't really specialize in a thing you kind of like hmm. hop around to different things yep. and so I, I was a specialist in visual arts but then I started writing more about performance because perform writing about performance is a lot more fun than for me than writing about you know paintings or yep. sculptures because usually when you're writing with visual arts you just have the one source but mm -hmm. with with theater like I, I talked to actors I could talk to directors I could talk to choreographers yeah. like all kinds of different people all came in to make the thing and that was just so fascinating to me especially as someone who really doesn't like people <laughs> like the thought that a bunch of people wanted to come together to make the thing like why why that's a crazy idea that's so much time to spend together why that's do you like too people many so people <laughs> too many people <laughs> this a psyche that as an introvert is really fascinating to me and so i and so i kind of enjoy writing about performance the most yeah and then uh, um, I'll just give like the really short version of this. Uh, 2010, I went to journalism school because I, I did, the thing about journalism, which is kind of similar to theater, that that's a, it's a similar intersection in that if you don't know anyone who has a background in the field, it's really hard to like get into the field. Right. Like it's, it's kind of nepotistic, kind of like you need to have connections in order to even get your foot in the door. And I'm like, I come from an immigrant background. Like no one in my family did this. I'm the one person in my family who actually has a creative career and they still don't understand what it is that I do, you know, versus what my sister does, who's like a pharmacist or a lawyer. Like that's easy to figure out. Like, what are you, yeah, right. are you a writer? Like, what, how? how, how do you make money doing that? <laughs> And my, my, my family was a tiny bit similar when I started doing theater. My my dad's mom was like, well, you know, because he was like, is there anybody artistic in our family? And she was like, well, 
your great uncle sold vacuum cleaners. And I was like, is that, that's the closest we have? All right, great. <laughs> I mean, it is an art to like try to sell people things. Uh, yes. <laughs> that is apparently the same thing as, as theater. Sure. Uh, hey, you know we're, all, we're all hustling in different Look, ways. You've got to hustle a vacuum. You've got to hustle an, a new American tragedy. Yeah. It's fine. A career. <laughs> anyway, so you're saying, so an immigrant background, people were in your family like, what? How do you make money this? Why? Okay. Exactly. And I'm like, oh, you can get a degree in this. And so if you can get a degree in this, and that means like there's going to be, there's, there's people there who tell you how to get into the thing. And this, and this kind, and this, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a tangent right now, which is a lot of young people now ask me, how do you start being a journalist? And I just say, you, you just start. You mm -hmm. don't really, most journalists, like you, we kind of just dive in and learn how to, what the building blocks of the form is at the same time that we're doing it. Like mm -hmm. when I started writing articles, for my school newspaper, I didn't really understand what, how you structured a story. I learned how to do that. I learned how to interview people just by doing a lot of it and learning, mm -hmm. oh, these are the kind of questions you, you ask if you want to get an actual good response from people. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's similar to playwriting. <laughs> I mean, you kind of can read as many plays as you want and watch as many plays as you want, but it is a different thing when you sit down and go, okay, now I'm going to make one of these things. Mm -hmm. Seems different than watching it. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, I gotta learn how to tell actors how to do how to do this in order for them to give me what it is I need for this play. Yeah, like it's all about yeah. learning how to communicate with people. But so in school, um, was it a two-year program? Was it a three-year program? Uh, and it was a year and a half, but Great. it was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> So probably expensive as your average two-year theater program. Excellent, fabulous, great. Yeah, right. That's I mean, are you glad you went? I'm glad I went in that it gave, it, it, it's how I got hired at American Theater, which mm -hmm. was, I did not see a job posting. It was yeah. an alumni of the program emailing a bunch of us saying, this magazine is hiring. I interned for them. They're great people. Here's a contact. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I mean, I, I will say, I do get a lot of questions about that. I don't know if you do as well about grad school. Should I go? Do I go get a higher degree? Do I da 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 da? And I wish it was not as expensive as it was and maybe that will change maybe elizabeth warren will help us all but um i do i do think it's worth it yeah and i have really mixed feelings it's really about i i knew exactly what i needed from the program which was i need to come out of this with a pathway to employment i need to and i need skills so that i could become a a, a more valuable prospective employee yeah for a yes. publication because freelance being a freelance journalist like you get paid like me at the most maybe maybe like five hundred dollars an article and yeah. you have to like chase down people to get paid for work and so it's incredibly hard to build a career as a freelance journalist and so yeah. the the way to be for, the pathway to longevity in this industry is is like you need to be with an institution which is yeah. really unfortunate because there's just fewer and fewer and fewer opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why I tell people the way to get started is to just, you just need to just cold email a lot of people asking them if they will let you write for them. Yeah. Which yeah. is like, and the ironic thing these days is like a lot of, um, a lot of publications actually need content because because, you know, content drives traffic. And unfortunately, the internet, the internet made it so that the only content that matters is things that drive a lot of traffic. Yeah. Which is a whole other. What? Yeah. Which is, which is a, when, you, when you're talking about theater coverage, which doesn't drive a, lot of, drive a lot of traffic, but is still very valuable to like a very passionate few amount of people. It's just like, there's just certain things you can't measure, but that's another. That's another that, that is another that. thing. Yes. C clickability or click baiting it, whatever that word exactly, is. Exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah. and so the thing is publishers need tra need content. The thing is they don't have a lot of writers on staff anymore because companies realize, oh, the most expendable people when we're out of money are writers and you, and there's so many people who want to write. And so we don't have to pay you benefits. We'll just use like a shit ton of freelancers. Can I yeah. curse on this? Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's actually a lot of opportunities if you're just interested in writing for people. Yeah. 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 Without getting benefits. 
and so what for, for me as someone who's been in this career for almost 10 years like like I always struggle with giving advice and telling people about my career because I've had a very privileged one and that I've always worked for an institution yeah and that's not the case that's not the common pathway for a lot of people now so yeah. I'm trying to give I'm not trying to give people as many like tools as and and to set their expectations and so they don't come in expecting their path their career to look like mine because it's not like a journalism career can look like anything and unfortunately you have to kind of build the blocks for yourself you can't I mean like, would you recommend yeah. people starting a blog I mean you know <laughs> everyone has a blog but but like doing that kind of to go here's how I write give a couple examples I mean I think as a theater fan and practitioner the more people write about theater the stronger the field is and the more mm -hmm. we the more we talk about this thing we love the stronger that thing is um you know without doing a ton of work for free but all of us have to do work for free before we kind of get that first exactly paycheck. exactly would you recommend people kind of doing little hot takes about <laughs> the theater stuff um no I, I would act i would actually recommend people one get a social media get a twitter yeah 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 Twitter is a cesspool, but at the same time, it is really, it's a great way to contact information of different editors and outlets, because yeah. that leads me to the next thing, which is get contact information of editors, so you can email them to ask to write for them. And you know, right. people pay, they don't pay a lot, but when you're young, like $100 for an article, like really helps you realize, oh, like my work has value, because I'm not a fan of giving away your work for free. Yeah. And I'm actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of having someone else read your work and give you feedback on it because then it helps make your, make your work better. And a good amount of my career has been editing other people's work, which yeah. has helped me figure out what makes an article work and, and readable. And it also like helps me, I'm, I'm hoping it's a way of me paying some things forward so that I can kind of teach people like how to be better writers or give people guidance because guidance is not a lot of thing, is not something that is really common yeah. as a journalist these days. Yeah, that kind of mentorship, that's so critical. Mm -hmm. So let's pivot to, talk, if it's all right, talking about kind of how theater journalists and theater critics, um, you know, kind of once this thing is over, it'll be a, a new world and we will have <laughs> to get together on Zoom again and talk about that once we know a little bit of how, what that, how that is. But I mean, in the past 10 years of your career, how have you felt in terms of this relationship between what you do and what playwrights do? Um, like, how do you, I know you've done a lot of interviews with writers, certainly at American Theater Magazine, and, and how, how do you kind of, what is the ecosystem that we both share and how, how does that look to you? Mm -hmm. It's funny. As a journalist, I get a I have a perception of what it is that I do, but I know that other people, other people place their expectations on me about what they think I should do. And so for me, it's always like a really interesting, like balancing act slash negotiation because mm -hmm. I sometimes, okay, okay, I sometimes, I feel like my career, my, my job has like different facets to it. Some part of it is like, people need me to cover their their shows yeah. so that it creates it creates buzz it it you know it lets more people know about it like basically i sometimes feel like a glorified publicist in that way <laughs> yes yeah um, I, I think everybody in theater would be like yep that sounds right <laughs> yeah I, especially when someone comes with me and they give me the how they want the story written they give me Ooh. who they want me to talk to and so it's just like am i writing this or are you writing this? <laughs> i'm sure a lot of marketing directors at theater would be like i can write it if you just want me <laughs> exactly exactly oh i have the perfect writer for you for this article and it's like okay we have to like <laughs> the, the art like arts journalism is kind of different from like politics because because like you can't really have an antagonistic secretive relationship because mm -hmm. you need access. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. 
So yeah. like the kind of, here's a show that by writing about it, more people know about it. Hopefully that drives tickets and yeah, conversation and, about it, that part of it. Yeah, that part of it. And then, and then when I started, when I wanted to branch out from that at American Theater and started writing more critically about the field and, you know, I had, I had things that were really bothering me about the field, which was like, it's lack of diversity, how it wanted, how it loved to cast, you know, white people as Asians. Like that was really weird. Like someone should write about that. Mm -hmm. And someone who's Asian should write about that. Or like, <laughs> or like it's practice of like underpaying people. Like, can we, it's like, I, there are these juicier stories I wanted to write about. And then I, and then American Theater Magazine, not to disparage the publication or the publisher, there was just like, there was a little hiccup because mm -hmm. one, we never covered critically, the field critically in that way. And also what would happen if we did? What, the, what, would, what would that mean for like our business model, which is like dependent on theater companies? What would that, what would that mean for like our readership? Would our, would our readership follow? Would there be a readership for this? Do people right. actually want to talk about this or would they rather it just stay you know, un under the surface, because it's just make everyone really uncomfortable. And so like, and so that's what happens. That's the downside of being really close to the people you cover, because mm. then you're also kind of hesitant to look at them critically. And so that's why, like, even now, like, I don't, I'm not really close friends with a lot of people in the industry, because like, there are certain things about the industry that still really bother me. And I really want to be able to talk freely about it. And it's really hard to do that if if you feel like you're going to like personally hurt someone that you know but isn't that kind of tough love like that's what we should be doing i mean that's what i i've loved so much about what you've done well certainly with your with you and the 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 um token theater friends that you're doing with jose i mean that's that has been i think really important and i mean obviously your your miss saigon piece drawing attention to yellow face and mm -hmm. and that I mean, that's just so important and it seems to have changed. I don't think you can really get away with doing Miss Saigon with white actors now, can you? Or if you do, like beware, cause somebody's gonna to, to put that out there. I mean, it seems like that has worked in some way, which is mm -hmm. great, bravo and congratulations to you cause what important work. And, and a lot of us doing the theater don't have the platform that you have, but it seems like in that case, certainly you used it to great success in like change making right but I, like looking back on it now it was definitely the right thing the right instinct to have but at the time it was just a lot of really difficult behind the scenes mm -hmm. conversations like I cried at the office a lot oh man during different parts of my career just because like you know I'm really passionate about the story and the story needs to be out there but we may not be able to run it and like as a journalist like it, I've written things where it's just never seen a lot of day Oh, that must hurt so bad. Yeah. Yeah, like, and I, you know, I'm sure as a playwright, you, you know, like, you've written plays. And totally, like, yes. And I mean, produce, because, you know, someone's not ready for it. Yep, yeah. Um, I mean, gosh, that's so interesting, because I do think that is, it's, it, I think now, like, Dominic Morso wrote something on some social media mm -hmm. platform <clears throat> about how maybe this is a chance to, like, not go back to the way it used to be. Mm-hmm you know, get the art form back on its feet, of course, but maybe there's different gatekeepers now. Maybe there's different bars to entry. Maybe we don't have the same, the same, you know, business as usual that we did. Um, and, you know, to, to a lot of what you're talking about, have these hard conversations more publicly and say like, no, mm -hmm. let's, I, these three plays, let's not do them anymore. I don't know if we need to yeah. do them anymore. And oh, we don't need to be hiring sexual predators, but yeah, but no, maybe not. Like that's the next phase. I feel like that's the next phase. Like the theater industry, like really taking a glance at itself and realizing, oh, there's a lot of problems with the way we do business and the mm -hmm. people we choose, whose voices we choose to amplify at the expense of other people. Yeah. And but no one's. But there's been progress on some conversations, but like such as with me too. Like there's there's not there hasn't been like that big field reckoning with that, and we know it's all there. Yeah. Yeah. But how important, I mean, this is a, yeah. in the strangeness of this time, maybe that strangeness kind of the, the fire, the forest fire has cleared the way to some new growth. Yeah, <laughs> to use a tired metaphor. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so too. I mean, granted, I, I was like debating whether or not I wanted to write that kind of piece of like, where do you go from this point? But mm -hmm. then at the same time, I'm just, these, it's like we're in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, I don't want to subtweet anyone who, uh, who has written those kind of pieces, but I just kind of, I don't feel like it's responsible because when you're in the middle of something, like you can't, you're still in the forest. You, yeah. There's no way to gain perspective right now because you're still in the middle of the forest. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, how are you um, in terms of being in the middle of the forest? Um, so there are some outlets for theater, all of these streaming things, audio plays, stuff like that. Do you, have you experienced any of those? Do you want to? Do you like that medium? Are you like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what's your kind of, what, are, are you enjoying any of those? You're like, nah, not so much right now. Uh, and I, I've been consuming some of it, like uh, my my job at Broadway.com, like we did a big uh, ben Rosie O'Donnell. Oh, I saw that. It was so cool. Benefit performance for the Actors Fund. And so it, it was just like a great way. It's, it's, it's been a great way to just see, see performers in like their natural habitat <sighs> without like the artifice and the filtering that kind of comes with the medium sometimes. Yeah, and so I've really been in, enjoying the rawness of mm. everything, and just it's yes, it's really some of it's really messy, and you know it's not like a it's not it's not going to completely replace the art form, but as someone who's like who's advocated a lot for access and for letting different like lower income people into the theater, making theater cheaper and more accessible for different kinds of people because it's just too expensive and it's seen as seen as elitist. I feel like. You know, you're tweeting about this, Lauren. Like, I feel like now's a great way to figure out how we can amplify this art form for a bigger audience. Yeah. Especially because, you know, I was reading, like, my governor, Andrew Cuomo, was saying, like, we're going to need to, like, reopen society in stages, which mm -hmm. made me realize, oh, then theater is probably going to be, like, the last stage of it just because the art form itself you need people in close quarters with each other and you can't right now. So how can the art form change itself? Yeah. And so I've been really actually been comforted by the fact that so many people like you, you want to create and you want to figure out like how to create for the restrictions right now. And so I'm really excited, hopefully after this, that we won't like streaming theater won't be like a rare entity. Like it can live right next to the live theater. Yeah, I love that idea. See, I just think that's so exciting. Because honestly, mm -hmm. I mean, I think about my theater going habits changed as soon as I had kids. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes getting out the door to get to that eight o'clock show is super easy. Everything mm -hmm. works fine. Everyone's fed and sleeping and it's okay. And sometimes it is a total disaster. And I actually mm -hmm. don't know until like five minutes before I'm supposed to go. And thinking about having infants and nursing at three in the morning and thinking, I would love to be watching a play or part of a play. And I can't watch most, I can watch 20 minutes of some Shakespeare from the National. Hell yes, I want that. That would be a mm -hmm. thank you. Oh my God. And being able to kind of take theater with you and having it more on demand, which is interesting because my favorite thing about live theater is that it's not on demand, that you come together in real mm -hmm. time, real space, real bodies, sharing air and sharing air now is a little, scary so exactly and not so much but how can we iterate how can we move be agile and move quickly and don't like wait because there's a couple of folks out there going like well let's just wait and see what happens I was like the pandemic is not waiting shelter in place is not waiting mm -hmm. and if theater can't respond quickly and hopefully and fully then what are we doing like what right. is this art for the point, but the, the, part, the point of theater is to like respond to what's happening in the moment. Like if someone costs during a performance and you have to like factor that into the performance. Yeah. And so what's been really, in, so, so the funny thing is, the thing I like least about theater is actually being, having to be in the room with an audience. I, because as a person who doesn't really, who really doesn't like people, I'm just like, you all oh. are in my space. I am not enjoying <laughs> this experience of sitting in this, in, in this house, yeah. especially when you get to off, off Broadway and it's in a seats are like all squished in together and you barely mm -hmm. have any leg room. It's like being on an airplane. Yeah. It's like 40 people right next to each other. And you're like, there's definitely only one exit and there's yeah. people <laughs> between me and that exit. <laughs> exactly. We're all going to die. I'm sorry. It's just, and, 
it's over. It's over. Give up. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but so what I love most about theater is the live aspect of it of like, okay, they're giving me, they're giving me the scenario and I'm going to, and I like seeing people figure out how to make me think this thing is happening in mm. front of me. I like like yeah. the challenge, like the mental gymnastics of that. And that's really interesting to me. Yeah. And, and so I don't know how you solve this problem, but at the same of bringing that kind of liveness, I feel mm -hmm. like like what we're doing now, like Zoom. I feel like that's a way to do it of like, oh, this person's like, it's kind of like watching an Instagram live video. Like, oh, this person's right in front of me and they're gonna figure out how to do something. Yeah. And like, I watched, you know, Kelly O'Hara sing a Stephen Sondheim song, like right on the live YouTube feed. I'm just like, is she gonna hit the notes? <gasps> she hit the notes. Oh my God, that is so amazing. <laughs> and like, it was still the same yeah. feeling. Um, yeah. Oh, this thing is right re happening right in front of me. Yes, we're not in the same room together, but I'm still getting something of that energy. And yeah, yes, we're not gonna. You can't some. You can't have like a, the coup de theatre and all the fun little effects. But maybe in the future, you we can figure out how to do that. I feel like mm -hmm. now's a great time to just really test some things out that we couldn't test before because mm -hmm. the industry was just too busy, you know, doing business as usual. Yeah, if there was one way to do it, and now we're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that one way is not anyway now so yeah. how do we iterate and of course i mean shouldn't have to be stated but of course it's not the same thing as live theater of course it's mm -hmm. th those things and what if we my, my whole point was what if we stop thinking them as the same thing or trying to be the no. same thing they're just different things they do different mm -hmm. things and the fact of how beautifully imperfect and bare these you know cynthia revo and shoshana bean singing <laughs> the prince of egypt song <laughs> i was like Y'all are made, all of the feels I were felt, all of the feels were felt. And like the angle was a little wrong and the lighting wasn't even, and, but it worked. And it's kind of the struggle of imperfection is part of what makes it so valuable and meaningful. And, you know, we're going to get better at this as we go along and there yeah. will be liveness and there will be the tension of will it, will it work and, and all of that. Um, but I just think like if artists can't, iterate and innovate then like but pass the mic because like there's some of us who are totally ready to <laughs> so mm -hmm. let's let's not let's put any blocks yeah. in the way while of course taking care of all the actors and making sure people are paid fairly and but I do think one of the biggest things that you brought up instantly was accessibility and this solves a lot of that and part of on the other side of this maybe we've made a lot more theater fans because people just got five minutes of it on their phone and were like oh that feeling is a new feeling. I like that feeling. Where do you get that feeling? Oh, at the theater? I will join you. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, this thing is only like like 10 bucks. Like and if you get it on your phone versus, you know, having to like pay like a hundred dollars to, yeah. to try to get into a theater because you know, I, I get a lot of free show tickets, but I do know how much things cost. And every time I had to like look up recommending shows to people, I'm like, okay, I know, I know it's 80. But it's really amazing. It is so good. <laughs> I know. It, you're right. About how much it costs. And I was like, I wish right. I just had a video like I could show you. Yeah. And then maybe it could oh, convince that's people. That's a good point. <laughs> that they they want the live version of it too. Yeah. 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 Because that that is a great point. I didn't think about that part of of your job of going like this show is great. Do this show. Part of if it is eighty, hundred, two hundred dollars. You know, there was that like cachet of being like, have you seen Hamilton yet? And, you, mm -hmm. and what they're really saying is like, how much did you pay to see Hamilton? <laughs> yeah, you wanted a privileged few who could afford a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, up to like some thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. if, you know. So yeah, I think, I think there's so much good that it does. Um, and if we stop thinking about us competing with the live form, I think it'll, honestly, honestly, if you give stuff away, people will pay for it later. <laughs> I really do believe that if that's part of what like the National Theater and the Globe and all these places giving the shows away for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. I am now a dedicated fan of the National Theater. Their performances mm -hmm. have, I am shook, I'm excited, I am it, the uh, different public kind funding, of funding, baby, that's what it looks like. <laughs> God, man, public funding. I know. Yeah, and I've really been loving like all of these different theater companies on the country making videos of their shows available just because yeah. 
like Victory Gardens is going to put Fun Home up. And I'm like, I've never seen a Victory Gardens show. And I've always wanted to see a Victory Gardens show. And now finally I can. And I don't even have to put play pants on. Like no. this is like my perfect moment right here. Wouldn't that be great? Because think about even as theater journalists, if you could review plays all across the country. I mean, this is what I want. I want to be mm -hmm. a paying subscriber to every major theater in America. And I can, if I can stream a show or two a season that they make yeah. available, I will pay for a streaming subscription to the Denver Center and theaters in Chicago and Atlanta. And, you know, I, yes, stop, please sign me up. I'm down. Because right. the, the reason like Broadway is, a, is seen as like a global industry and brings people in from around the globe is because of the Tony Awards. Yes. And it's yes. because it's because which like, are streamed which hmm. are streamed it's like oh a 10 year old will like see like a performance of you know hamilton at the tony wars and then be like oh my god this is what i want to do with my life or i want to go see this show yeah i and had like, that experience we, as a kid mm -hmm. like no. that's what most people's first experiences of this art form is 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 not live it's all virtual and so yeah it's like Think of things as competition as like really a capitalistic model, which I'm really surprised that all these like nonprofit, you know, cooperative teamwork people are like, mm. that's the first instinct. Yeah. When it should, when instead of like trying to find some way to cooperate with this other platform. Yeah. And oh, like, it's it, a good point. The Tonys, it's mm -hmm. a streamed thing. Hello, we're already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's like we're always a multi-million dollar industry because it, it's able to get audiences that are not just local like 60 percent of a broadway house is filled with tourists yeah and so like what what if like other theaters around the country could figure out how to get also get like audiences that aren't just the local audiences like yes amazing theater is local but at the same time like you there's untapped potential mm -hmm. and broadway hd already has a platform for it i like that platform i've really enjoyed that mm -hmm. I, you know, and the PBS great performances that much ado. Oh, with that was so good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I made my kids watch some of that. I was like, y'all just sit down and get your damn Shakespeare. It was really yeah. good. That's how that's how you build people. And yeah. at the, and also I saw that one live and I got rained on for 30 minutes straight. And so not having to see that one live and get rained on soaking is, wet. <laughs> and yeah, be soaking wet during is, you know, that's something that doesn't happen if you're watching it at home. Yeah. It's interesting because I worked with Audible, of course, and do, mm -hmm. they yeah, don't do, of I course, video performances, but the, the audio performance. Yeah. And it's so interesting yeah. because there was a lot of people. That's such a good they, play, by the way. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. I love that one. Um, but what was really cool is we would, because they released the audio play version at on almost on opening night, then mm -hmm. you would have this crossover, actually. People were hearing yeah. it. And if you lived close enough to New York and be like, you know, I do want to go see the amazing Kate Mulgrew and this and the amazing Francesca Ferradani. Hell yeah, let's go. And I know enough about it because I've heard some of it or all of it to go like, yeah, the show's for me. And I know my mom would love it. And I'm, my cousin's going to, I'm going to take my cousin and y'all let's go for real. And, and then for people who don't live near a theater, um, they get to experience the great Kate Mulgrew and the great Francesca Ferradani as well. So it kind of seems like a win-win, but anyway, we're going to figure it out. Yes, and yes, we will. We're going to make it anyway, because that's what we do. Yeah, I find it really, because right now I find it really dangerous to be telling people what they should be or shouldn't do while they're in quarantine, just, just because like people, oper you know, people respond to trauma and grief in different ways. And for some people, it may just be like me, like just making a lot of food and not really doing a lot of consumption right now. Yeah. Or like for you, it may be creating things because that's that's the best way that you can feel process what it is that we're all feeling right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so like I, I'm gonna be, I'm really curious to see like I I don't want and I want to put like I find it unhealthy to like put a stopper on how people are processing. Agreed. Yeah, because like. I don't know, you do you. Like this is the exactly. ultimate you do you time. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is I don't have to pay for any of it. So why am I gonna accept it's, I don't think, why am I gonna sit back and criticize it? It's free. People are trying a thing. Mm -hmm. It's irresponsible to really stomp wanna stomp that out because it's basically saying, Oh, you you can't do the thing that makes you feel better right now. Yeah. 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 Anyone who's saying that is like definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so which is kind of, actually why I'm not actually writing at the moment, just mm. because like it's it, it's been a it's been a conscious decision for me because like my my career is just like okay every week you got to put you got to make content you always have to hustle for for everything and right now I just really want to sit back and just let and just sit with all of it and just and just be consumed by all the feelings that everyone is mm. feeling and then. And then maybe when we're closer to being out of it, like then some kind of, that is when hopefully the brilliant thoughts will start churning again. Definitely. But, but I actually don't feel, it's like, I, I feel like as journalists, we always feel the need to like respond or like add to, add to conversation as a way of trying to put con control it or as, or as a way for, you know, to like, establish our own relevance and right now I am okay with not being relevant yeah I think I mean I haven't really been doing much creative writing I mean I just started writing a thing the only stuff I've been able to write is stuff that I knew I was going to have to write a long time ago anyway it's been on my docket got to get that mm -hmm. draft in you know it's not the play the, the thoughtful play about now because how the mm -hmm. hell are you going to write that now mm -hmm. um and I I'm having trouble writing anything about now that is not I wrote an op-ed and, and these classes and these interviews have been such a light for me because I think in the pause, I wanna talk about theater. I'm not able to make it right now or even make the beginnings of it, but to mm -hmm. talk about it and to remind myself like, oh yeah, that thing is great. That's a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> seems, seems good and helpful. Um, and yeah. I'm like dreaming about, about what you want the field to look like. Cause I, I've been thinking a lot about, like I, I'm seeing, you know, all these theater companies like having to lay off a furlough people oh, like I'm, I'm a furloughed person so I feel the pain of not having that stability at the moment and so like I'm, what I'm really hoping and I was I was gonna write something and then I thought you know what we're like in the middle of this and I don't really know how I'm gonna feel in like a couple of weeks or a month about this so I'm just yeah. not gonna give in to my feelings right now because when you give in to like really harsh feelings you kind of regret it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But like, I'll just tell you, but like what I'm really hoping, right? Like after this is over, like people realize that a theater isn't a building. It's not, mm -hmm. it's people. And this whole, I mean, industries, you know, over, over prioritization of things of, over people is, I feel like it's really come to a head. And I hope that after this is all over, we realize we need to really, treat the people who make theater better we need to prioritize their well-being instead of instead of like spending all this money like buying up real estate yeah. or trying to expand like production budgets like yeah. we're like trying to figure out how better take care of each other so that next time a really big terrible event happens like a bunch of people aren't left scrambling for unemployment like yeah that's so that, great. A theater isn't a building, it's people. That's perfectly mm -hmm. said. I mean, that's exactly what we are realizing is you can't make theater without the other people who are making theater. And that's true if you're an artistic director or a scenic designer or playwright or theater journalist. I mean, it's, it is this web of humanity that makes the whole thing happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're still making it happen. Like you don't need a stage right now to do what it is that you're doing. Yeah. You just so, need like your other friends who are on Zoom. Yeah, right. Like, yes. And like we're really going back to basics here. And I really find that refreshing. It is. It is interesting. We are going back to basics. And one of the basic is a good story. You just mm -hmm. need a good story. And that story mm -hmm. can be on a Zoom stage reading. It can be a house reading. I had Kate, Kate Cortese, whose play uh, Love, um, the world premiere was at Marin Theater Company. Of course, they got like a week of run of performances in before they had to cancel it. But mm -hmm. she, she like posted a video of her daughters reading the first scene of her play. <laughs> you know, it's such a great play. They're like, sure, you can read it at your house with your family. You can get on Zoom and read it. And it can be broadcast, it cannot. And I've gotten so many requests from college productions who had to be canceled. And it's kind of like, yes, Zoom your play. Like, do it, put it out there. Because part of it is not about putting out there. It's about the doing. Mm -hmm. And it's how, how critically it is to feel those stories, um, whether you're watching them or, or reading the, the roles or anything. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's also, it's also like a muscle. Like if you don't like, 
what we're all just going to be in stasis for three months and not do anything. (laughs) But it's, I mean, I will say these, the access to these plays, I haven't. I love it. Yeah. I just, there's something about it, which I I don't think I've ever really watched a play on screen or video because I've always been like, I mean, it's not the same, so I'm not gonna. But now I am. I'm bowled away by some of the productions and the, mm-hmm. the experience of it, particularly the Much Ado, um, the public's Much Ado, and the Hamlet, the Globe's Hamlet I watched, and the, the ACT's, Eric Ting directed Gloria, which was mm. amazing. Oh my God, it was so good. And I felt it, I just, I felt like you were not only just a part of something, but helping a thing. I mean, these are... I don't know, we're proving a point, proof of concept. Can theater live in a way that is more shareable, more equitable, more affordable, more accessible? Yeah, if it can't, then like, that's not the theater I wanna be a part of. So yeah. anyway. I'm feeling very, I'm very, 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 very smug about this conversation because it kind of like proves like everything that we've been saying for the past few years. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> about like, yes, this thing, this thing does not have, you, have, you don't have to speak to it in person to like really love it. Yeah. It's like, you were saying that, and like suddenly, oh my god, it's happening! Like I, I'm really interested to see, and I know no one's going to release it, but I'm really interested to see like metrics and how mm-hmm. it's like how many people are tuning in and like how many people watched like Gloria. I really want to. Watch I that. think ACT might because I got a, mm. a um a survey afterwards, being like, how many people did you watch it with? Did you watch it in one sitting or a few? Like really smart questions. So I think we should definitely follow up on that. Reach out to them and be like, somebody needs to ask them what they found when they did it. And I don't know, I think, I, I bet it's more, it, it was quite well watched. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wonder like, was it all by San Francisco people or was it people all over the nation? Not, like, yeah. of course not, of course it was all over, so. No, I saw, I, I know people in New York who watched Gloria. Yeah. I did yeah. not watch Gloria because I was really depressed that week. And so. Ooh, that's a tough one, yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I know, I know enough about it. I'm like, I know I'm not gonna feel good. Cause it's about, it's about journalists. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh my God, it's about journalism. <laughs> some, I'm like, I'm gonna anyway, no, I'm just like, I, I, I'm gonna go watch Happy Shit right now. We're gonna go. We're gonna move on. We're gonna watch Shit's Creek and feel really good about ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I say, gee, if you want to do it again, <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's it is just interesting. Um, I I, I feel like this is going to be a proof of concept for a lot of new mm-hmm. ideas, and I'm really excited about what that would mean for a whole industry. We're closing in on our hour, and I wanted to know if you feel comfortable talking about like your favorite shows ever, like that you've ever seen, the ones that you're always like, let me tell you about these three experiences or whatever that you've ever seen in the theater, knowing how much theater you see. <laughs> oh my God. I like that's a that's a really hard question <laughs> because I, I didn't, because I see like on average 150 shows a year, so like there's just so many things that just like really so many categories. It doesn't necessarily so need to be like the best play, but like the one that you just left being like yeah, like maybe it was the cheesiest, most wonderful, like boppy kind of show, or one that was really like dark and like ooh. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, have, I have multiple. An- I have multiple answers for you. Fabulous. I expected that much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the the thing, the show that got me into theater was Phantom of the Opera, oh. and which actually, like, you can watch the Royal Albert Hall performance of it. They mostly st- they they staged they staged it mostly, and so and I I showed it to like a friend of mine, and and he really loved it, even though he'd never seen it on stage before. But like you got the same feeling of like, oh my god, those notes, those notes were hit. <laughs> they hit them. They hit exactly. the hell out of it's them. So powerful. And uh, so that that's like that's what I kind of go back to when I'm when I just really need to like feel really raw feelings. Mm. Um, the, I mean, the best. But I mean, I saw what the Constitution means to me by Hayashi Shrek like three <sighs> times in the theater, which has never happened to me only because I'm, well most, mostly because like i'm when i'm not the, when i'm not a journalist i'm actually quite poor and so <laughs> in the theater it's really a dangerous habit to about, have yeah here's the thing about theater especially when it's off broadway you can really love something and then you cannot see it ever again because it's sold out and you can't get in or tickets are just so prohibitively expensive that I would like to. I I would like to eat dinner this week. I can't afford to go see a show. <laughs> but I was lucky. Oh, like so sad and true. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, I remember like, getting mad at it at one point of being like, oh, theater should be free. <laughs> And I, like as soon as I turned 30, like, oh, I, I don't qualify for the, you know, like the young people discounts anymore. I know that felt like a slap in the face. I was like, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It's like, no, I still can't afford a hundred dollar ticket. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, nothing has changed since when I was 29. <laughs> that mm -hmm. I can now afford like four times more expensive tickets. Yeah. Uh, I did love Heidi Shrek's What the Constitution Means to Me. That was such a revelation of form and mm -hmm. comedy and feminism and politics and like every surprise I was just mouth agape the whole time and you got a copy of the constitution that's so cool exactly and I heard that the, she, they're gonna try to they, they're gonna try they were filming it or were in the middle of filming it or going to try to and make it more widely accessible and that's like that is one of those things where it shouldn't just live in the moment it is important is important enough that it needs to be seen by a shit ton more people yep it needs to be shareable you're totally totally right yeah, yeah that there's that yeah i know there's that i mean recently i saw you learn yeast cambodian rock band and i paid for it the second time too only because it was 25 dollars so like that's been like my favorite thing like i've i've seen this year oh i love that that and show is so great mm -hmm. and that's she is such a show. bold exciting hilarious writer yeah and it's like well and it's like, you know, as someone who also comes from, you know, it's about like a, a dad who immigrated from, from Cambodia and having to deal with trauma and, and in a very atypical way and have, and, you know, having someone whose parent, my parents also came from very traumatic backgrounds back in Vietnam. And I never seen like that representation of the very particular immigrant immigrant trauma mm. that's not pornographic and it's actually quite dark and hilarious at the same time like I yeah it's never been I've never seen a, or heard a play like that before yeah and and, and so like that it, it was just so beautiful and joyful which is really all you can that's all, all you can really hope for that's all you want in this art form you know in the world that's mm -hmm. what I want mm -hmm. more of <laughs> we will get the we'll get back there soon those are pretty yeah. awesome recommendations that span a lot of genres yeah and Cambodian rock band is going to have a cast album it'll be out oh, in may right. yeah so, and that, that, that that's another thing like cast cast albums like that's a lot that's that's a lot of people's first entry entry into a show as well and that, that's another form it's Another like when people streamable form. Exactly. See, we're already doing it. We're already doing it, and it cast albums didn't take away doesn't take away from the live experience. No, my sister knew every word of Hamilton before I. This was me being like the greatest sister when I surprised mm -hmm. her for her birthday, like walking up to the theater. I didn't tell her we were going, and then it was like there was the marquee, and she was like ah, but she already knew the whole thing, and she told me afterwards she was like listening to it and then seeing it obviously you, there's so much more there and she kind of did not have any way to fathom what it would look like or feel like on stage live but enjoyed them separately like she still jams out while she's baking her fabulous cakes to, you know she'll she'll still jam out to it and that is a different experience than being there and seeing it and they can both exist in their own simultaneously yeah well the first time i saw hamilton like you know it was like is at the public and i i have so no one none of us knew what what it was and the thing about and the thing about me is because because I'm bilingual so I when when it comes to musical theater I actually don't hear all of it initially mm -hmm. like I'm maybe 50 percent of the lyrics of a, a musical the first time I hear it like I don't catch it because mm -hmm. it's just so too fast for my brain to process and Hamilton especially oh god especially <laughs> like that is the fastest spoken and I love a fast I love a fast show but even me I was like I think I got, I got, I got almost that, almost all of it. Yeah, I got maybe twenty five percent of Hamilton the first time I saw it, and especially so it Daveen like, Diggs' character. Where I was like, yeah. that you are an athlete of language. I mm -hmm. cannot figure out how you did that." Anyway. Yeah, it's one of those times where I'm just like, I watch subtitles for every film, for everything that I that I watch. Yeah. I, I use subtitles, and yeah, that's I'm just like, can I just turn something on? Right now I can't. It's like my brain is so tired. Just tell me, <laughs> yeah. So like the cast album was like, it was just great for that reason because theater, you can't catch it all the first time. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, like I'm wishing I could revisit so certain aspects of certain scenes just because like, uh, I feel like I didn't get all of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think we're on the verge of something new and exciting. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that that's what we were going to talk about in this today, but I'm so glad we did because I think it does help me envision some hopeful, new, exciting future where there are lots of ways to talk about and experience theater. And, you know, theater's not going anywhere. It's been around too long. It's like, you can't, you can't kill me. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, it's going to be, it's going to be different. And you know what? Like, I, 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 I'm paraphrasing, but like I, but not from someone else. But like normal before didn't completely work either, and so I don't want to go. I don't want to go back to normal. Like I, I want us to evolve to our next state, and I want it to be a a landscape where more people can fall in love with it, more people have access to it, and maybe a landscape where I can maybe revisit a show I really loved once in a while. Because yeah. you know, because you know what. Yes, it's really great to have like Brand Jacob Jenkins' Octoroon in my memory, but it would be really great if I could just see it. Yeah, just like, can I play? I just need to see it. And you know, that also, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's such a good point because at moments when I, I want theater to help me process a thing, if you lose somebody, if you fall in love, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like, I kind of need to see this play in this state of me. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be rad mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, let's just say that's gonna happen I'm just gonna yes. say like that's... I'm putting it out there like equity can figure out how to make sure people get paid yep. every time I rewatch something like it's just the infrastructure is there I'm realizing now that we're actually a lot more flexible than we than we were and yeah. so I'm really excited I'm just hoping people see it as an indication that we need to move forward instead of trying to recreate what what was well what at least the two of us will remind exactly. them at every step <laughs> exactly maybe <laughs> that's the thing maybe that's the thing all right after i come out of my hole yes maybe forward, forward. <laughs> exactly. but also we can all just chill and take care mm-hmm. of ourselves no pressure no productivity exactly. required all yeah. good stream it if you want to stream it don't if you don't want to mm-hmm. um i'll be productive the rest of the day there's like my there's a I was yeah, like, oh, Thursday, I have this call with Lauren. Okay, after that, I don't, ha- I don't have to do anything. No, we're done. <clears throat> we're totally done. <clears throat> My cat has made her cameos. We are all good. <laughs> um, I'm just going to end this by saying thank you. Just a massive thank you. And um, let's do more of these because you are such yeah, a vital please. voice and so important in how we make and understand this thing we love. So thanks. Well, thank you for making sure I stay relevant, even though I'm in hiding right now. <laughs> You will never not be relevant. <laughs> Your hair is awesome. Your glasses rock and you have a cool cat. So thank you. All right. Like, likewise, fellow pink hair lady. Yeah. All right. We'll talk soon. Take Definitely. care.